should know, I didn't mention this at the beginning, that um, the call for proposals for faculty fellowships goes out in the fall. And um, this is not, these fellowships are not awarded by our office. Our office facilitates the awards. Um, it is a blind peer review. So I will say that I didn't even get a chance to read them. Things were so busy before things happened. We simply blinded them and gave them to our uh, our implementation team who spent the time reviewing them all and it was a very difficult <laughs> choice this year a very competitive group but please do keep a lookout for in the fall for the next call for proposals and now we're going to hear from our very first our inaugural student fellow Kazel Pelias who spent some time in Papua New Guinea <laughs> Okay, I want to go ahead and start by um, uh, thanking Dr. Dorchester and thanking, um, uh, of course, Hilary Landor, wherever she is. <laughs> there she is. Um, uh, for going and giving me the opportunity to um, really do this. Um, thankfully, thanks to um, money that they went ahead and they acquired for me, I was able to go ahead and actually go off to Papua New Guinea and um, uh, with Dr. Tudor Parfit, um, recognized a very um, uh, important professor here um, at FIU International University. And um, uh, he really makes a living out of um, looking for the lost tribes of Israel. And it's, a, it's apparently such an adventurous um, uh, sort of profession that he's gone ahead and been titled the Indiana Jones, the English Indiana Jones. Yeah. And um, uh, I thought I was like, goodness knows, when I went ahead and I, I actually looked at um, uh, who I was traveling with, um, uh, I was absolutely surprised. I was like, what kind of adventure am I, am I in for? And so um, uh, I went ahead and uh, let's go ahead and start this one by describing the Gogodala, which is exactly what I had to go ahead and look at before I, I started doing anything or thinking about what on earth I was going to do with, um, with what I was able to do once I got over there. Um, uh, and they're a hunter-gatherer society. Um, uh, they live in the Fly River province in southern New Guinea. And um, uh, they, embrace, they embrace a sort of messianic form of Judaism. And so, um, uh, unfortunately, um, there's a really huge political issue between the Gogodala and the state of Israel because they want to go ahead and the reason why they came to Tudor Parfit several years ago, around, I believe, 2004, while he was giving a lecture in Sydney, was because he wanted to go, they wanted to go ahead and prove their, their Jewishness. Um, they wanted to go ahead and, and find out if they really were related to the original tribes of Abraham. If, um, uh, if, and if they were, to go ahead and somehow um, be taken by the state of Israel and be granted aliyah, which is the a right to go ahead, given to all Jews all over the world, to go ahead and be able to come back to Israel and be repatriated in the Holy Land. Um, uh, and as you can imagine, um, there, was, there were a lot of sort of political issues that came about with this. Um, uh, so there was a history of exposure to missionaries, which is one thing that went ahead and already we were off the bat. It's like, well, it could have something to do with this, you know? So their, perhaps their very first exposure to Judaism was because of the missionaries that came over to New Guinea in the early 20th century. Um, uh, and you know, that was really the community leaders. When I went ahead and went over there, I observed that a lot of the community leaders, they, they were very adamant about going ahead and, and distributing this knowledge to the people, you know, that they were Jews, that they went and they deserved these things, they deserved to go back to Israel. And so, um, uh, as you can see, Aliyah there spelled in the Hebrew. Um, uh, yes. And so these are a couple pictures of them, of uh, the Gogodala. When the missionaries first came over to New Guinea, they went ahead and they, they, they had this sort of notion when they went ahead and looked at their faces, like, you have very Jewish features is what it was that they went ahead and told them. And so um, uh, these, these sorts of things went ahead and they stuck with the Gogodala. Um, uh, there were certain traditions that were held before that um, because the Gogodala did have a sort of um, day of rest and it, oh, it always landed on our Saturday. And that would be like the Sabbath day. Um, uh, in fact, they had a name for it, which was Sabbat Kadepa. Kadepa being day and Sabbat, some unknown word that came from some unknown place, perhaps of Jewish origin. And so here you can go ahead and see that they're, you're, they're a rather modernized society now. They, they play rugby like in a lot of Commonwealth nations. 
Um, uh, over here, you have some traditional dress, but that doesn't come out really until maybe people like me, you know, people who are from outside of the society come along and they want to really go ahead and show that. Um, uh, typically, they'll be going ahead and they'll be walking around with scullies like that and living in these stilt houses. And there's some houses, in fact, that are still, that are now um, uh, at the at floor level and they have a very nice, um, uh, un uh, not university, they have a very nice school there a vocational school where they're going ahead and they're starting to train people for modern day jobs, which is one of the big issues with going ahead and going to a modern country, as you would imagine. And so um, uh, that was one, one of the things that I was worried about. That, and I wondered if these people were granted some sort of Ali and some sort of distant future. I mean, how on earth is it that, you know, a hunter-gatherer society is going to go ahead and adapt to a modern nation? which is one thing that um, probably Israel would go ahead and review if they ever did go ahead and contemplate granting them Aliyah. So in Gogodala identity, which is really what this entire study was about, and I was given you know, the opportunity by Tudor and um, uh, Global Learning to go ahead and research their medicinal culture, which is only one aspect, but I couldn't help myself. I had to go ahead and try to engulf myself in every single aspect of Gogodala society. So once I was over there, I tried learning the language. I walked around with the people. The first thing I did was get in trouble with Tudor by going ahead and, and um, uh, going off and exploring the entire village while everybody else was still unpacking, which I should have helped, I know. But I'm uh, a bad guy. But, and so I went ahead and I walked around and they were going and showing me this and the other thing. And it was very nice that I went ahead and did that the first day because later on, I had to go ahead and travel around the village collecting these little roots and these um, uh, pieces of bark. And so um, uh, they gave me a couple names because of my friendship with them. One of the names they gave me was Gogo. And Gogo, as you can see, is the root for Gogodala. And Gogo means west, which is part of this sort of, um, uh, of uh, oral tradition that they have They've, that's been passed down for who knows how many years, probably a couple millennia, um, uh, about where they might have come from. And that really is another thing that goes ahead and might hint towards something that might have to do with what it is that they believe about the Jewish origin. Because they believe that originally they came from two canoes that um, uh, came from somewhere in the West, an island that they had a name for, but I've since forgotten, unfortunately, the name of the island. And um, uh, Dalagi, which means man. So, Gogodala, in literal translation, would be men from the West. And so um, uh, they can trace their heritage back to these two ancestral canoes, whose passengers founded the eight clans. And of course, like in many hunter-gatherer societies and tribal societies, they go ahead and they don't marry into their own clans. They oftentimes marry outside of their clans. Um, uh, so the missionaries who came over, they really went ahead and, and they really riled things up. What ended up happening is that there was a, a severe disrespect for their culture. They went ahead and they, they took a lot of their, their totems. In fact, can I go ahead and have my, the, the artifacts brought out? Yeah. Yes, wonderful. These, these totems, which you'll go ahead and you'll see right now, um, uh, they used to be hung up in these 500 foot long um, longhouses. And so they were there to go ahead and keep away evil spirits and keep away um, uh, evil things. There they are right there. I've gone ahead and I've already shown them to a couple of my friends and goodness knows they've been frightened. So I can imagine for any spirit wanting to go ahead and get into the longhouses, I'd probably want to go ahead and frighten them away. And so this one right here is a male and this one is right here is a female. Anatomically correct, beautiful craftsmanship. Um, uh, and as you can see, these are the tribal symbols right here. On her stomach, his stomach. And uh, this is probably from the Dog Clan, which is one of the eight clans which they have in the Gogodala Nation. And so, unfortunately, there's not too many of these things left around because many of the original ones have been destroyed. These, thankfully, are reproductions of, the ori of original ones in which they would go and hang up in these places. And um, uh, after the longhouses were destroyed, of course, they went ahead and started building churches and they started going ahead and giving out Bibles. And so that's where this Messianic Judaism started coming about because they started going and keeping the Sabbath day instead of going ahead and um, going on to the Sunday. They took it into their own culture. They integrated it. After the 1950s, the missionaries just they went ahead and started um, uh, leaving. They started trickling away. And um, then they were given that opportunity to go ahead and finally build maybe a, another longhouse. 
Um, that one, unfortunately, I think there was an issue with a hurricane, and that one went ahead and came down. So I wasn't able to go and observe it or bring any pictures back. But believe me, they were huge, mighty, majestic things. So the purpose for the trip, as I explained, was to go ahead and find out this sort of Jewish identity. Um, uh, originally, I was to go ahead and perform a sort of genetic testing on them. But unfortunately, those things went ahead and they fell through when I was given um, uh, the job of checking out their medicinal culture and seeing if that had any sort of relation to it. And I'll tell you something very interesting about it very soon. Um, uh, but, uh, but yeah, and so uh, in the end, we were over there and they were asking a lot of questions on genetics. Thankfully, I'd taken enough genetics classes here in FIU to go and explain to them how the whole deal works, how they can go ahead and be traced back to these people. And in the end, that genetics won't be specific enough, unfortunately, to go ahead and really tell them whether they were part of Israel. Um, uh, they, it might tell them, because there's a lot of Jews all over the world. You know, this Jewish population doesn't necessarily mean that they're Jewish. I mean, already in Spain, um, I, I was going and reading an article by Dr. Abraham Lavender here, who I wrote my research paper with, and he went ahead and found out that I believe uh, 30 or 40 percent of men in Spain are somehow related back to Jewish ancestry. And so what does that mean? Are they all going to be transported all of a sudden to, to Jerusalem? No. No, absolutely not. And so um, uh, we went ahead and we went over there and they got a chance to talk to all the students, um, uh, all five of us. And um, they went ahead and they asked me a lot about this sort of genetics issue and I told them how inconclusive it could end up being even if we did end up sequencing their DNA. So we have to be very careful, very careful with what it was that what we said because we didn't want to go over there and be the next missionaries. You know, converting them over to Judaism, converting them over to some sort of idea that may not even exist. We were there to only go ahead and help them in their questioning and their curiosity to go ahead and find out who it was that they were. Because unfortunately, the missionaries, the first ones who had come along, they had taken it away from them. You know, and so they had to go ahead and almost uh, collect all these sorts of things. And, um, uh, and in the process, they created this sort of Messianic Judaism. And so that's what it was that um, uh, Rabbi Sussman right here, going ahead and explaining in front of the delegation in this um, really nice um, pavilion that they went ahead and they set up in the middle of town, he went ahead and he explained um, uh, what it was to be Jewish. And he gave very nice, very direct classes about what it was to be Jewish. And that Messianic Judaism under, you know, what Israel believes is not Judaism. And so um, uh, that was one of those things that, that were rather hard to go ahead and explain because of this sort of cultural divide between, you know, a Western beliefs on Judaism and what the Gogadala believed Judaism was. And so we go ahead and we get to the question of uh, medicine and well-being, which is what I was there for. And so eventually I had to go ahead and um, uh, you know, settle down and really start getting down to what it was that I needed to go ahead and research. And um, uh, I found out that um, like in certain Jewish traditions, like in certain um, Abrahamic traditions, um, uh, there was the power of the word, which they went ahead and they called Gilala. Oh. And Gilala um, uh, was this sort of thing that um, was passed on through the people who could channel it. They could channel the Holy Spirit. And these people, they went ahead and they were in groups of about maybe eight or so, 10, and they were typically women. And these women would go ahead and they would oftentimes dress in white or blue, and they'd administer the word. And um, these women in, the, in their groups were called um, prayer war warriors. And I'll go ahead and I'll show you a picture right now of the prayer warriors. I'll go back to this one. And the prayer warriors right here, they're not healing this woman. No, this is a woman who was actually channeled the pain of a, one of our female rabbis, also um, uh, a Sussman, married to um, Rabbi Sussman, the one you saw earlier. And she had this sort of um, chronic condition of leg. And so they went ahead and they took the opportunity to show them the power of the word. And this woman right here channeled this energy, channeled these pains into her own body to then go ahead and fall into this trance to go all the way back to when it was that this pain originally went ahead and became part of Rabbi Swissman's body. And so here they're actually trying to go ahead and take the pain out of her body and kind of dissipate it into the, into the ether. This is Balimo. This is where it was that we were staying, a very beautiful place. 
you know, I, I was going around and I was really wondering why on earth they'd ever want to leave a place like this. Because their, their, their diet oftentimes consisted of um, uh, sago, fish, um, uh, a very simple sort of diet, a lot of roots. Um, uh, but there were, of course, issues. Um, right here, I can go ahead and I can tell you that there was an issue of AIDS. Um, uh, there was an issue of misinformation because of missionaries who had gone ahead and said that the, and reinforced their idea that these sicknesses and ailments were caused by evil spirits. So, I mean, these sorts of things, we, we were there when we were going ahead and talking to them, we were talking to the people at the clinic, and there was no doctor at the time that we were there. So that's one thing that definitely has to be worked on. And um, these are the things that people go ahead and oftentimes resort to, um, to go ahead and heal their ailments. And um, uh, whether they're a placebo effect or whether it's, it's actually working in some sort of physiological way, um, uh, they're taking it and they believe it to be effective. And they've been taking it for hundreds of years. So we have mango bark, which is used for snake bites, which I was absolutely surprised. I mean, goodness knows, I can go into my backyard, get bitten by a snake, and then go across to, the next, to my neighbor's yard, take some mango bark. I didn't know that. And then there's ginger, too, which is used for upset stomach and pregnancy termination. Um, another thing that was used for pregnancy termination was the bearing of the placenta, which they believed to go ahead and work. And they preferred those two things instead of using actual contraceptives because they believed the contraceptives went ahead and actually increased um, uh, um, sexual promiscuity. And so they didn't want that. And because of the other things that the, the missionaries had told them, um, uh, these things were a real issue. And so there was also popo, which, they, which we call papaya, or fruta bomba. Um, uh, the seeds were used for malaria, and other parts were used for cough and influenza and the common cold. And I can go, the list goes on and on and on. Teme, one which I thought was absolutely interesting, is a piece of bark that people burn in order to go ahead and fall asleep. That one's very interesting. Um, uh, let's see. And uh, let's bring things into perspective then. Let's go ahead and finish it off. Um, so I, I believe in going ahead and bring, bring all this back to you guys. To going ahead and seeing that there really is a sort of um, uh, phenomenon going on with people all over the world. Already here in my country, the Dominican Republic, um, there's a very similar thing going on where, you know, you have these prayer warriors, you have these prophets who are going ahead and taking these sicknesses out of people, and they're following not only that, but a messianic form of Judaism. So it's, there's something going on. You know, this is a really good springboard for may, perhaps future, future research on these messianic sort of um, uh, I identities that are sprouting up all over the world, perhaps from missionaries who have been into these places. And so um, uh, the gold dollar made up of approximately 25,000 people. And, um, uh, and so I think it's a really good puzzle piece in going in and solving the whole question of religion and how religion really is associated with um, our own identities, even if we're not religious at all. So um, uh, in conclusion, um, the gold dollar are people whose identity was brought to question after the missionaries of the 20th century, as I went ahead and um, stated. STDs and AIDS is a very big issue there. And um, uh, definitely the main proponents of the desire to actually go to Israel wasn't even really from the people, but really the tribal leaders. So definitely if I went back to go ahead and do this research um, and continue it, um, uh, i definitely stay for a much longer time. As I told Dr. Razzo here in, in ethnography, is a very good class which went ahead and kind of egged me on in, in going deeper into this work. And I'd go ahead and, and get into that question of identities and these messianic movements. So I'm Guy Kavik Bega. Thank you so much, all right? <laughs> yes, yes, of course, questions, anyone? Um, they might have had a physician some time in the past, they might have traveled through, but there is no permanent physician, unfortunately. I mean, getting there is already very difficult. I mean, we, we, we went ahead and we took a military plane into Balimo, and so it was a very bumpy ride, and I wouldn't imagine very many doctors, unfortunately, would want to go ahead and take that, at least Western doctors, you know, and it's not, there's not much in it for them, you know. Um, unfortunately, um, uh, I've been going and taking a medical anthropology course here in FIU, and you know, you really see how it is that a, a lot of medical training here oftentimes isn't as, medical, as um, culturally sensitive as it could be. So really to go ahead and get people in there and um, get people involved, I mean, it takes a little bit of education. It's very important. I think somebody said here earlier that education is very important. 
And so um, definitely it's um, educating even the educated and letting them know that, hey, these things are happening. Yes, they do. They, ha they do. They have a clinic and they have, yes, they have drugs and they do have these things, morphine and all these nice things to go ahead and help these people out. Um, so they don't have to completely rely on these medicines or the prayer warriors. So, um, uh, but unfortunately, the, many of them don't really visit the clinic. The clinic really is a sort of last resort issue. If they can't do anything about it after they've gone ahead and they, they've gone to the, the folk sector and they've used their roots, their plants, and then they've gone through the prayer warriors and God, and that hasn't done anything. So they go over to the drugs. And so that really is, unfortunately, the sort of path that's taken by the Gogodal in that community. No, no, I don't, I don't believe um, uh, it really is a monetary thing. It's a cultural thing. It's a cultural thing, and that's something that's very difficult to go ahead and change, if it ever does. Time for one more question, if there's Yes, they did. They did. Um, uh, unfortunately, didn't have time to go ahead and present it, but they did go ahead and they did have a sort of worship on Sunday. And they went ahead and they had this whole sort of um, uh, thing lined up where they went ahead and they separated the men from the women. And um, uh, there were these prayers done. And there was this sort of thing where one person in the very front of the pavilion went ahead and they started the prayer. And then everybody else began, and then the prayers increased in cacophony, and they went ahead and they got to a certain point where some of them fell into trances. And so um, uh, that definitely was one thing that happened. They read from the Bible, and then they would go and talk about community issues, community needs. At that time, the community need was going ahead and assessing us and how they were to take care of us. Unfortunately, I felt a little bad going and sitting there. And so um, uh, that was really what it was that they were doing. And so, yeah, they do have a sort of thing. Mm -hmm. How similar this one you find that their kind of sorcery, the other kind of sorcery you committed, is more important to give to those people? Do I, do I see if it's different? Yeah, with similarity and differences between their practice. Yeah, there's definitely plenty of similarities and differences. First off, they don't circumcise. You know, they don't circumcise. They don't go ahead and um, uh, keep kosher. They're eating prawns from these lagoons. And really, there's a sort of environmental... Um, restriction to going ahead and being being that way. I mean, they they they're still hunter gatherers, you know, in certain sectors of their society, and um, even though they do have um corner stores where they can go ahead and buy um cornered beef and all these other nice things, um, they they still have to go ahead and rely a lot on the environment and what they can get from the environment. So that kind of keeps them from being kosher, and um uh, between the the society that I have over here in uh, Dominican Republic. You know, the Messianics that they have in the Dominican Republic and um, these over here in, in New Guinea, um, you know, there's a lot of similarities with that. And if I had more time, I would definitely go and present it. They're using they're using the Old Testament. They're using the Old Testament and they're using the New Testament, too, um, because they're they're Messianic. So they do believe in Jesus, but they don't change any of the old traditions of, of Judaism. That's really what's going on. Bravo, Kesel. Thank you so much. This was truly eye-opening.